This is Mountaintop History, a podcast dedicated to telling the story of Monticello and all who lived and labored at this plantation. I'm Kyle Chalton, and today we're focusing on Margaret Baird Smith, a writer and Washington socialite with a remarkable story from the early American Republic. In many ways, Margaret Bayard Smith's life marked the contours and boundaries of what scholars call Republican motherhood. She became great friends with Thomas Jefferson and left extensive letters and reflections about her time within the American political sphere that have become invaluable to historians today. To discuss her story, I met with Dana Kelly of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. Yeah, so, so Dana, let's just get things started. So, um, you know, I asked you a few weeks ago um, if you could um, help us explore uh, with our listeners, Margaret Bayard Smith. She's a super interesting figure in American history, early American history. Um, and uh, she, she of course, is very uh, influential in the Washington, D.C. political scene, uh, she's a biographer, but if he could just, you know, get, paint a picture of, you know, who is Margaret Baird Smith? Yes, and of course she becomes a great fan of Thomas Jefferson Absolutely. when she meets That's him. That's the real reason why yeah. we're talking about her. <laughs> but she was a well-known writer for her time. Um, she wrote a couple novels. She wrote children's stories. Uh, she wrote a diary and hundreds and hundreds of letters. And the reason we know so much about her is... About 60 years after she died, her grandson gave her letters to this um, gentleman, Gaylord Hunt, who edited them, collected them, and had them published in this book called The First 40 Years of Washington Society. So we'll talk more about that later. But she was actually born uh, during the Revolutionary War, so 1778, to a well-to-do family in Pennsylvania, grew up in Philadelphia. Her father was a a successful merchant, and even though she was a girl, she got to go to school, a very good school, uh, the Girls' uh, Moravian Academy in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Uh, She was very bright, intellectually curious, so she was well-read and even studied things like science and literature. So this was part of a movement back then, uh, started just before, I think just before the Revolutionary War and lasted for a few decades, and it's been termed Republican womanhood or Republican motherhood, and not referring, as we use that word today, you think of the Republican political party, but this refers more to a person who believes and espouses the ideals in a republic as opposed to a monarchy. You've read about this, yeah, right, Kyle? That, yeah, actually, you know, when I think about Republican womanhood, I remember studying, you know, U.S. history, you know, back in high school. And this is obviously a, a really important or it, it's 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 important in that, you know, it's going to be very influential um, in American history. And of course, Margaret Bayard Smith is almost the quintessential example of Republican womanhood, right? Right, because the idea is, okay, if girls are educated, this will be useful and and help to protect the Republic and its ideals because they'll pass their knowledge to their children and this will be useful to their husbands as well. So that was kind of the impetus behind it. But while these new ideas allowed women more opportunities to be educated, there were still limitations to how women could behave in this American society. Yeah, and also, you know, one of the things I think is is really interesting, you know, when we're talking about uh, gender roles, as specifically as they relate to women, um, it's definitely in flux, right, in this period, right? Because prior to this idea of Republican mo- womanhood, I'm, I'm being a, a little kind of gross in kind of in my generalization, but basically the idea is that women you you the men need to be watching over them and 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 they they might veer off in a different path and they they're immoral they're, they're immoral yes, and, kind and, of like that. Yeah. yeah exactly but then all of a sudden this weird moment happens where it's the the women who will help steer them towards to towards the shore and that they will be kind of the moral compass uh, in the country right 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 and um margaret baird smith when uh, she's 22, she marries her, her second cousin, uh, Samuel Harrison Smith, and they move to Washington City, 
I think the year is 1800, and of course Thomas Jefferson has been elected and is going to assume the presidency in 1801. And uh, Mr. Smith starts a newspaper, but Mrs. Smith has a mind of her own, and she writes essays and articles, uh, sometimes even um, for her husband's newspaper, although anonymously, uh, because she's, she's a woman. <laughs> So she can go just so far, but then she hits sort of the glass ceiling. And she gets frustrated with this in her life. And she complains sometimes about the drudgery of her domestic duties. <laughs> she would rather be writing. Yeah, at one point she expresses that frustration with these words. She says, I am a woman, and society says, thus far and no further shalt thou come. Why then has nature given me a mind so active and inquiring? Margaret Baird Smith and her husband were a powerful political couple in their time and socialized with ambassadors, secretaries, and even presidents such as Thomas Jefferson. But then they are what we, today we'd call a power, power couple, I guess. They're, they're, um, they're in with the A-listers. They know everybody in town. And she writes letters to her sisters-in-law and her sisters. She's always going to balls and parties and card parties. I mean, this is all more... Back then, in the mornings, women paid calls to one another and had teas. And then in the evening, she tells she writes to her sister. This She sums up what they've done in the last week, couple weeks. Since my last letter, we have been at a large and splendid ball at Mr. Robert Smith's a dining party at Madame Pichon's, a card party at Mrs. Gallatin's, at Mr. Beckley's and at Mr. Van Ness's, and, um, and then uh, a card party at the city assembly. So she's talking about um, the secretary of the Navy, the wife of the French ambassador. Um, let's see, a, a, a Van Ness is another congressman. She also goes on talking about Mrs. Anthony Mary, the wife of the British ambassador. I mean, this is like in, in, in one week's time. <laughs> <laughs> There's a really nice story when she first meets Thomas Jefferson. Uh -huh. Now, what her family and the... She comes from a Federalist family. That's one of the twists in the story. Um, and the way they talked about Jefferson, she'd always heard as a, a child, you know, um, they... He refers to them as, she says, that violent Democrat, that vulgar demagogue, the bold atheist and profligate man. Is, is this the man I have heard so much about? So she hadn't met him. Her husband was friends with him because they had been in the American Philosophical Society together. And her husband's a Democratic Republican. But one day she's at her new house in Washington and a gentleman uh, knocks on the door and is ushered into the parlor. Her husband's not home yet. So she ends up sitting down and talking to this man for a long time, and they have a fabulous time. And he's so interested in her and so polite and so dignified, very soft voice, very mild-mannered. She is completely smitten with this stranger. And her husband comes home and introduces her, and of course, it's Thomas Jefferson. So everything her family had ever told her is, you know, out, out of her head after that. And she and Thomas Jefferson were lifelong friends. They really had a great um, admir you know, respect and fondness for one another. And eventually, you know who she gets to know really well? Thomas Jefferson's oldest daughter, Martha Jefferson Randolph, because Jefferson's a widower. It's often his oldest daughter and her children, and I don't know, not often, but occasionally, they join him at the, at the president's house. And she and Margaret Baird Smith become fast friends, really, for the rest of their lives. Margaret Baird Smith became such great friends with Jefferson that she visited him and his family at Monticello. Her visits and subsequent recollections have become invaluable insights into life at Jefferson's Monticello. But eventually, she makes her way to Monticello, and and we uh, here at currently at Monticello as as guides. Uh, Margaret Baird Smith's <laughs> recollections of her time at Monticello are a real treasure um, when it comes to resources and really getting a sense of what it was like uh, to be at Monticello during Jefferson's retirement years. Exactly, yes. And after reading this book of her letters, I realize how 
how many of her stories we guides use on our tours, especially to illustrate fa family life, Jefferson, you know, the grandpapa, because he retired in 1809, he was 66, and that year, Margaret Smith and her husband made a trip to Monticello, and she wrote pages and pages and pages, and that's where we get a good idea sort of of the daily routine of the household. Uh, she talks all the time about Jefferson's and his grandchildren and their loving relationship. Um, that's There's a story a lot of us use when we have kids on tours about Jefferson setting up running races on the West Lawn and how um, he uh, staggered their starting position to give the younger children a little bit of a, an advantage and then would sort of wrap them in his arms as they as they finished their races, and Mrs. Smith was sitting with him while he did that. There's a, that, that um, infamous story is how he convinced her to go for a ride with him in his horse-drawn carriage. It's a very small seat in his phaeton, but somehow Mrs. Smith, um, Thomas Jefferson, and his granddaughter Ellen got in this little carriage, and he's taking her on this wild ride through the roundabouts roads on his plantation. She said, the first one was smooth enough, and I enjoyed the scenery and the conversation. But then they got so rough and so rocky, she was afraid for her life. And he says something like, Madame, you know, trust me. Uh, you, you know, I won't let any harm come to you. Don't get out of the carriage. But uh, sure enough, she sees a huge rock coming up, and she <laughs> leaps from the carriage. <laughs> Um, and, and that's not too surprising, given that she's not the first person who expresses dismay over Jefferson. Over Jefferson's <laughs> driving. <Yeah. laughs> um, and you also get um, an idea of how, how sickness really pervaded life in such a big way back then. During that visit, Jefferson's granddaughter's baby had just died. His daughter, Martha Randolph, is sitting with a very sick child in the nursery through most of the visit. So M Margaret Smith is great friends with um, Martha Randolph, and she spends a lot of time up in the nursery just keeping her company. Um, and um, they actually, Martha Randolph pulls out a box of letters her father sent her when she was a girl in France. So Mrs. Smith felt very privileged to be privy to those letters. At one point, <laughs> she goes up to sit with Martha Randolph. She says, oh, she's enjoying her book, so I, let, I, let, I left her alone. So I thought, well, what is she reading, you know? Is it Virgil? Is it John Locke? And it was, you know, it was just the wild Irish boy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, so these are little details. Where else would you get these? Exactly. You know? so Perhaps more than anything else, Margaret Bayard Smith's life marked not only the American political social scene of her time, but also the gender roles of white American women, specifically of Washington, D.C. Since this is Women's History Month, uh -huh. let, let me tell you something. Um, she wrote, this was 1814, she wrote in a letter about life in Washington City, as they called it, and um, women's place. And she said, um, the women here are taking a station in society which is not known elsewhere. On every public occasion, a launch, an oration, an inauguration, in the court, in the representative hall, as well as drawing rooms, they are treated with marked distinction. I think the manners here are different from other, those in other places. At our drawing room, at our parties, few ladies ever sit. Our rooms are always so crowded that few more could find a place in the rooms. The consequence is the ladies and gentlemen stand and walk about the rooms in mingled groups, which certainly produces more ease, freedom, and equality than if these rooms than in these rooms where the ladies sit and wait for the gentlemen to approach to converse. So it's almost like there was a different etiquette in the capital city um, because the women and men are mingling more and ta talking um, on equal levels. And that's, I like that's that. and it sounds like that's like the perfect environment for Margaret Bayard Smith, right? Perfect environment for her. <laughs> This has been another episode of Mountaintop History, a collaboration podcast between WTJU and the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. This episode of Mountaintop History was made possible in part by a major grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities.
Join us for new episodes every two weeks on Apple and Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and the Virginia Audio Collective. To learn more about Monticello or to plan your next trip, visit us online at monticello.org.